اسمي العلي من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المفلومين وصلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي حجة الله يا ابن الحسن يا صاحب الأسر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ما جرس بازن سيسد الإسلام السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته It is a pleasure to be joined with you on these spiritual days of Shahr Ramadan where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's month unfolds in its mercy towards us from many different avenues and through many different vehicles. Inshallah, our plan for this series is to dive into one of the many du'as that we are recommended to recite regularly during this holy month. And this du'a that I'm alluding to is the du'a beginning, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allahumma adkhil ala ahli al-qubur as Allahumma, and then it goes on. And I'm sure this is a du'a that many of you are familiar with. It is a du'a that is recommended to us to recite after our daily prayers, our obligatory prayers during the holy month. Now, I know that we've all done it, and I still do it, and I probably will forever do it, which is reciting a surah or a du'a or a ziyarah just for lip service, not really truly understanding its meaning, its power, its beauty. And in Shah Ramadan, as I mentioned, there are plenty of these. And thanks to translations, we actually do get the gist of the basics of some of these styles, especially this one. The, the translation is, is usually quite clear. A lot of us follow it either on monitors in the Husseiniyat, in the mosques, or you know, just generally, we, we've seen it on, on websites and we've we found the translation for it. And despite this, it's quite notable that when we read the translation, it does come across a little bit straightforward. O oh Allah, enrich those who are poor. O oh Allah, provide food to those who are hungry. It doesn't seem particularly deep on the surface level of it. But of course, as we all know, any word uttered by the Ahlul Bayt wasalam, is divine. And therefore there must be depth to it. So the goal of this series is to try and dig deeper into this dua so that it can mean a lot more to us rather than just the surface value that we've all come to know it. And our way to do this is not going to come from myself. It's going to come from this beautiful book entitled Manifestations of the All-Merciful by Sheikh Al-Khalfan. And may Allah provide him with a lifelong time of sustenance and rizq so that he can serve him and bring us all closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his commentaries and reflections. We thank Shaykh Al-Fan for compiling this book. And if you are eager and if you want to get ahead of the curve, you can absolutely find this available online at alislam.org. It's completely there, so you can jump right ahead. But for those of you who wish to perhaps have a more uh, excited, audible, uh, hopefully I'll be able to provide you with that service. And any mistakes that I made are entirely on my shoulders, and I ask you for your forgiveness, and any benefit comes from Sheikh al for he wrote the book, and I'm sure he would tell us, and I believe he says in his, uh, in his introduction, actually, that this is all as a humble service um, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us all closer. So, let's zoom into this. And this du'a is attributed towards our dearest and greatest Prophet, Nabi Allah al-A'zam, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And we do have a hadith in Bihar al-Anwar where the Prophet says, whosoever beseeches with this supplication in the holy month of Ramadan, after the prescribed prayer, غفرت ذنوبه إلى يوم القيامة. His sins, his ذنوب, shall be forgiven until the day of judgment. So, we'll try and go verse by verse, if you would like to call it what verses. There's around 14, 15 verses, short verses, in this du'a that we will explore and try to dig deep and ponder 
into each of them so that it transforms its meaning. Now, in this introduction, I'd just like to lay out maybe I think it's three or four points that remain consistent throughout this du'a. And it's something important for us to, in order to begin our journey to understand that the, some of the depthful meanings behind this, um, we need to understand some of these premises before we go any further. And they'll, mean, they'll be true throughout the entire course. Firstly, and this is a point that remains true for any du'a, and probably any ziyara, I would say, but any du'a that we recite, um, and that we must keep in mind in, in, in this journey that we're about to go on, is that du'a isn't just a mere utterance, verbal utterance. Rather, combined with that, it is a state of real want, of a real want for something. And we surface this want, this desire, by vocalising it, by saying it, by reciting it. But what we need to make sure is that if what we are saying doesn't actually match with what we truly want inside, as I'm sure you can imagine, the, the supplication will lack that kind of oomph behind it. It's similar to as if, if you go to a family and you say, I love you, but your actions speak very differently and inside you actually feel very differently. It'll feel quite empty. It's like, yeah, I love you, whatever, you know, move on. But actually, if you see someone who has passion with that love, who has conviction in that love and he really believes it the utterance of it is just a way to vocalize it but deep down is where it actually truly originated from so when we go through a start it's important to keep in mind that what we are saying we need to truly truly have conviction in and believe in and really stand by and you'll see how that plays an importance as we go through the du'a itself the second thing and this is quite a depthful point, actually, um, that we need to reflect on in this du'a, is that if you look throughout the du'a, typically and regularly, it uses the preposition of kul. Kaf, lam, kul, meaning every. And what is the significance behind this? It's that this du'a constantly calls for the betterment in many different factors, satiating the hungry, enriching the poor, etc. But it does it for everyone. You're doing this to offer everyone. There's no condition. There's no only for my father, my son, my daughter, my this, my that. No, it's for everyone. Kul. Allahumma alhani kul la faqir. Kul. For everyone. And why? It's because we as human beings have been fashioned with the attributes of Allah, our creator, we have we can manifest some of his attributes. And one of those attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has is an infinite amount of is mercy. And this mercy, this Rahman, this all embracing mercy, regardless of who, this all embracing mercy is a key attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And innately we as humans actually want the betterment for everyone. It's in our nature, it's in, inside us that we feel pleased when we see someone else improve or benefit from something. Now, of course, you'll be saying, well, that's not always the case. And we'll come on to that. We'll come on to that as to what could be the cause behind that. But innately, actually, we enjoy seeing the growth of others and others progressing and receiving such blessings. And similarly, how we would wish them for ourselves, because this is a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes of his Rahman. Now, the evidence behind this um, in terms of that this is being a very divinely way to think. We can evidence this from uh, many angles, but here's, here's three examples. Firstly, in Surah Al-A'raf, Surah number 7, verse 156, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa kull shay. And my mercy encompasses all things. Kull shay. Again, that kull comes back in. Kull shay, i.e. every dependent being. A second time where we can see this is in Surah Al-Anbiya, Surah number 21, verse 107, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses Nabi al-A'zim, where he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we have not sent you, but as a mercy, not just for man, not just for Muslims, not just for the believers, but actually, رَحْمَةً lil. Alameen, for the world. There's a very deep point behind that in terms of it's not just man, it's actually for 
all of the worlds, but we won't go into that for now. But again, it's this idea of all encompassing. The Prophet was sent down as a mercy for all of the worlds. And a third one, and this is quite a topical one, considering we've just departed from the holy month of Rajab, uh, which is where we have in the Rajab du'a where we say, Ya may yu'ti man lam yas'aluhu wa man lam ya'rif tahannuna minhu wa rahma. O one who always gives even to one who does not ask him and who does not even know him out of his kindness and his mercy, regardless of how you've treated Allah, he still provides this unconditional mercy, this Rahman. And this is important that for us, we recognize that actually there is this notion in our faith of all-encompassing mercy, and that we should also have this attributes and this da'a as I said we can regularly say kulla kulla every every unconditional and an example of this is that when we see Prophet Isa alayhi salam where he says be like the sun it shines upon the virtuous and the sinful regardless the sun one of the greatest blessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and we probably take for granted Regardless of if you are the worst of dictators or if you're the greatest, i.e. the prophet, you receive the benefits of the sunlight. And we see the Ahl al-Bayt, regardless of who they were with, whether it was their best of friends or even whether it was their enemies. And we hear so many stories from how Ali salam treats the one who struck him in the month of Ramadan. You see it with such all-encompassing mercy. And this is something that we want to try and replicate now as i said earlier what if actually i don't feel that way what if i don't actually want this mercy or i have this kind-heartedness to everyone what if that's not true of me as i said for us as creations of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is one of Allah's attributes and we can manifest that. We actually innately want that. But if we don't feel that, there's a reason. One of those reasons could be that perhaps through our own negligence, through our own sins, through our own egos, through our own pride, we block that feeling. And that is something for us to recognise, Something for us to ponder over when we recite this da'a. I even just zoomed out. But you know what? I'm about to recite this da'a. And truly speaking, now I remember that it's, you know, all encompassing. And I'm putting no conditions here. And I want betterment for everyone. Yeah, I need to get comfortable with that. And maybe I need to let go of some grudges. Maybe I need to let go of some frustrations. Maybe I need to let go of some things that have happened in the past between me and this person, me and that person. And that's tough. But it's an amazing way to begin this journey of reflecting on... Do I really want to be or act in a divine way, if you like? Do I really want to step in the footsteps of Ali Muhammad? Because if I do that, then of course I end up with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. Now, there is one point just briefly to mention, which uh, again, Sheikh Khalfan mentions in here in a lot more detail. Um, but just to give a brief part of the discussion, which is, okay, if this all-encompassing mercy that we're talking about, what about those who are actually active enemies of Allah? And again, we've given the example of uh, the killer of Imam Ali Ali, so Ibn Muljim. However, I just want to touch on this, which is that even if you're an enemy of Allah, you still receive this sunlight. And if you're the greatest, if you're the closest to him, you still receive the sunlight. You receive its heat, its light, its etc. The question is, what is it that you do with it? So what we're saying is, should I actively pray for the betterment, for the increase in sustenance and extra mercy for even the enemies of Allah? And actually what we're saying here is, look, this mercy is all-encompassing. That sunlight will reach the worst of the worst. The question is, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all giving. He is merciful and it's unlimited. He will give, 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 no matter who you are. The question is, what have you done with it? The blessing of the night sky, for some, will be received as a way to pray in the secrets of the night. And they take it that way. Whereas others will take the blessing of the night sky for an opportunity to perhaps commit theft or robbery. So of course, when we recite this du'a, we're saying, look, Oh Allah, provide this to everyone. Provide this to everyone. However, 
if that person, and when we recite this, of course we're doing this with the intention of it bringing everyone closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, if that person who receives it wants to use it in a different way, does not want to get closer to Allah, she wants to take others away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be in charge of that and he will judge them accordingly. But our intention for this is, of course, that we want this, these blessings, we want this, we want this, uh, all these blessings and this ni'mah that we're asking Allah to provide to, 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 to everyone to be as a means so that they can obviously recognize their Lord and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the blessings that they receive. So that was the second point, which is that this is a very all encompassing dua and that it's all about all encompassing mercy. And we, we as humans need to maybe assess ourselves do I really want the betterment for everyone? Because if not, maybe it's. You know, this this du'a is actually going to be speaking against what my soul, what my, you know, current state of mind is. So I need to correct that and get my soul back into a better place. And the last point to mention in this introduction, which, again, like I said, these three points will remain consistent throughout our discussion, uh, inshallah, is that in this du'a, you'll notice that we are regularly praying for those who we are actually absent from. You know, it's not like, my friend is sat opposite me and I'm saying, oh Allah, grant him long life. Oh Allah, grant him this. And he's there like, oh, you know, what a nice guy. You know, and I get a little bit of enjoyment out of that. No, it's actually when I'm potentially alone or maybe in congregational prayer, but actually reflecting on it myself, I'm not actually talking about anyone that I can see or anyone that's going to hear me. I'm not sat next to someone who is, as is described, as is uh, translated into as, as poor. We'll go into what poor means, but we're not actually sat next to someone perhaps who is poor and saying, I'm praying for you. We're actually saying, you know what? I'm reflecting on those in society and I'm thinking about you and I'm praying for the better of you, even though I don't know you. Maybe I know you and I'm absent from you or maybe I don't even know you and of course I'm absent from you. And actually there's so much beauty in that action of praying for someone when you are absent from them because it truly means that, you know, you, you have something deep for them. You really have something that you know that you want for them a yearning for them and you don't have to do it you really don't no one's watching of course Allah is watching but no one is actually watching it's really coming from your soul to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have a narration that's attributed to the prophet where he says nothing is accepted as quickly as one supplication for another in his absence and perhaps that's because of the purity that you hold when you're really praying for someone and they're not next to you and again as I mentioned before when I said if you don't have that feeling of yes i want everyone to benefit from these blessings and from this mercy from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if i if i don't want that then maybe it's my ego and my pride getting in the way similarly here this notion of praying for everyone whilst you are absent from them is also pulling towards this mindset of removing any egotistic nature about yourself not being self-centered not just sitting on the masala and saying oh allah please give me this please give me this please give me this you know shopping this Santa style, in fact, if I can say that. It's actually taking a step back and saying, you know, al jar from the neighbours, then the household. Think about the others before I think of myself. So just to recap those three points. Number one, which is that we need to ensure that what we are saying and what we vocalise is actually coming from within. There's actually something innate within us that we really want this to happen. They need to be in harm needs to come from within and then we will vocalize it secondly this da'a is calling for the betterment of all which is a very godly trait it's a very godly trait and we need to question ourselves whether we truly want that or not and maybe that requires us to remove our ego and change our mindset and thirdly is that we're looking to pray for many who we are absent from and again this this notion of everyone out there first and then myself and maybe i need to adjust my ego so just as an introductory point um inshallah this is something that we can take away and use as we now go through the da'a line by line verse by verse or however you want to describe it and as i mentioned all of this is coming from this exceptional book manifestations of the all merciful by sheikh khalfan and if you want to jump ahead by all means al-islam.org you can find the book on there i'm sure you can buy a physical copy as well so inshallah, in our next episode, we will kick off with the first line of the dua. Allahumma adkhil ala ahlil qubur al-surur. 
والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Oh, oh, oh.